Welcome everyone to part three of the series I'm creating on Nick Saban. If you haven't watched them yet, you can find part one and part two of this series by either looking at my recent videos or clicking on the links in the description of this video. You should also see a link to them on this screen to start the video. This was going to be a three part series initially and halfway through writing this script, I realized I had 30 to 40 minutes of material just for when he coached at LSU in Miami. I think what my plan is now is to pivot on Nick Saban after this video and focus on other stories. I still have a ton of notes of when Saban coached at Alabama. So if these Saban videos eventually do well, I'll definitely come back and finish this later in the future. Regardless, I hope you've enjoyed everything so far and I definitely think you'll enjoy this episode of the series. This is the College Football History Channel and you're watching the story of Nick Saban. Just for a recap, in part one of this series, we covered Saban's playing days and his introduction to football, from his local Pop Warner team, to leading his high school team to a state championship, to playing for Kent State, where he was part of their only MAC championship winning team in school history as of today. We ended that video showing his introduction into coaching, where he was a grad student at Kent State and worked his way up the coaching ladder at various schools. We started part two of this series at his biggest coaching job to date, as a DB's coach at Ohio State which is coincidentally the only coaching job that Nick Saban has been fired from. From there, he was an assistant at Navy, Michigan State, and for the Houston Oilers. He became a head coach in 1990 for the Toledo Rockets, but that only lasted a year. After his good friend and mentor, Bill Belichick, swiped him up to be the defensive coordinator for the Cleveland Browns. After proving himself there, he took advantage of a great opportunity to be the head coach at Michigan State. He had a few average seasons before the 1999 season, where he led the Spartans to a 9-2 record, beating many of their big rivals. We ended the last episode with him deciding to leave Michigan State out of nowhere and taking the head coaching job at LSU. I didn't say a whole lot about that entire transition and left it open-ended for the most part. I wanted to save it for this episode, so here we are. Nick Saban has told the press and the Michigan State team that he's taking the head coaching job for the LSU Tigers. I had talked about how Saban recently decided to hire a new hotshot agent Jimmy Sexton, an aggressive agent who along with other factors convinced Saban that he wasn't appreciated enough at a school like Michigan State and could have more power and be paid more by transitioning to a different program. When Saban got to Michigan State in 1995, he had a base salary of $135,000. By the 1999 season, with the help of Sexton, he was now making close to $700,000 a year. And let's be honest, at this point in time, Michigan State wasn't really a football school, they were more of a basketball school. Nick Saban had also just learned from the psychiatrist at Michigan State, Lionel Lonnie Rosen, aka The Wizard Man, about something called process thinking, where Saban no longer cared about silly little things like the score of a game or even winning the game. No, Nick Saban only cares now about the process of becoming a champion. He only worries about giving his best effort along each step of the process and has learned to accept the end result. You just worry about each individual step, such as the next play, the next practice rep, the next meeting, the next lifting rep, the next conditioning sprint, the next recruiting visit. Solely worry about and give your best effort in each of these events, the things you can control, and be okay with the outcome. Because there are many things you can't control while running a college program, like the media, the fans, the refs, and political and geographical factors. But if you can get your entire team on the same page to only worry about giving their best effort for their own job, then you can create a perfect version of your team and be okay with the outcome at the end of the season, win or lose. Saban was able to use this process to upset a number one ranked Ohio State team in 1998 and continued to use it to turn an average six and six a year team into a more dominant player in the Big Ten for the 1999 season. I think deep down Saban knew he had something here with this new process and decided it was time to go to a school that would let him do whatever it took to achieve his next coaching goal, a national championship. The problem though, is that even though Saban thinks he's mastered this process, he forgot that he hasn't mastered his social skills. And right now, he sneakily decided to transition to LSU, assuming everyone would be on board with him. His initial plan when taking the LSU job was that six of his assistant coaches would follow him from Michigan State. The issue is, as covered in Monty Burke's book, The Making of a Coach, it seemed like the coaches didn't know he was ever interested in LSU, and they were now getting blindsided with this new offer to go to Baton Rouge. Saban got with his assistants he wanted and tried to persuade them to come, confident that at least a few of them would. He even sent a plane to East Lansing to bring them to Baton Rouge. The night before the plane arrived, all of the coaches got together, kind of shocked at the whole situation. They didn't like learning about the LSU job last minute. 
Also, the LSU in 1999 is not the same LSU you see today. At the time, Michigan State seemed like a better job, and their program had a better outlook at the moment compared to LSU in their eyes. Also, the interim head coach was going to be their assistant, Bobby Williams. They all kind of liked Bobby Williams. He was more easygoing than Saban. I'm sure Saban's hard to deal with personality played a big factor in the potential job transition too. When the plane flew back from East Lansing and arrived at LSU, it was empty. Not one coach decided to follow him to Baton Rouge. After all this transpires, Saban starts to kind of freak out. I believe he started to have big doubts about this. I said this in the last video, but Saban has seemed pretty anxious during most of his coaching changes. As someone who has never understood their goals career-wise, I completely get it. It's sometimes easy to not like the job you currently have and abruptly change it up because you feel like you have to, only to immediately regret it and wish you could go back to your old job. A day or so after taking the LSU job, Nick Saban calls one of the Michigan State trustees, Joel Ferguson, very upset and says that he thinks he made a big mistake and wants to come back to Michigan State. Ferguson called the president of Michigan State, M. Peter McPherson, to tell him that Saban wanted to come back, and they were open to the idea of him returning. Throughout the next day, they tried to call Saban to tell him, hey, you can come back, but they couldn't get a hold of him. Ferguson stated in the making of a coach that when he finally reached Coach Saban, Saban told him, Joel, this won't work. The first time I have a mediocre season up there, they'll remember this. In the end, he stayed at LSU. He signed a five-year contract that paid him $1.25 million a year, making him the third highest paid coach in the country behind Bobby Bowden at FSU and Steve Spurrier at Florida. Both of those coaches had already won a national championship and had very successful programs. This type of contract for someone of this resume was completely unheard of at the time. Michigan State fans and players were pissed, saying that he was selfish and only leaving for money. I do personally think that Nick Saban wanted more money. I also think he wanted to leave for the reasons outlined earlier. I also don't believe that Saban thought LSU would actually pay him that much. In the making of a coach, Burke thoroughly describes Nick Saban's interview with LSU. The interview was held at Jimmy Sexton's home in Olive Branch, Mississippi. The LSU athletic director, Joe Dean, and a few of the LSU trustees held the interview. LSU had recently had some tough losing seasons under head coach Jerry DiNardo and was in the middle of a $55 million stadium renovation. They were desperate to sell tickets and needed a big time hire. One thing I forgot to mention last video is that Saban was always very prepared for interviews and liked to carry a yellow legal pad with him that had his notes on it. Saban started his interview with the Tigers off by very confidently interviewing the LSU staff instead of them interviewing him. He asked them why they thought they couldn't win. The state of Louisiana had some of the best talent compared to any other state in the US. Nick Saban has said on the show, head coach in the Nick Saban show, that one big reason he was interested in the LSU job was that when he was working with the Browns, they did an analysis to see where all the players in the NFL were from. Not where they went to school, but where they were born. When he did this in the early 90s, LSU was the first per capita in players playing in the NFL. He then asked them about their academics at LSU. Their past coach, DiNardo, struggled to keep players academically eligible. When Saban asked about academic resources on campus, Joe Dean and the trustees had no good answers for him. On one of Saban's weekly radio shows in 2021, Saban talked about when he had his wife Terry fly down to LSU the week before taking the job to scout out the area, and it confirms that he was very interested in the two issues above. While there, Terry reported to him, they don't have very good facilities, they don't have an academic center, there's a lot of things they don't have that I think they need. But she then said, I went in the weight room, and they've got a lot of damn good looking players. Dean supposedly asked him next why he would leave Michigan State just as things are starting to go well, and Saban just flat out said, Michigan. Not only did he struggle to get the resources he needed to create a powerhouse at Michigan State, he had to also compete with arguably the biggest brand in college sports, and that still even holds true today. One of the trustees for LSU said that as the interview was winding down, Saban made a bold proclamation. Within three years, he would win an SEC championship, and that within five years, he would win a national one. Jacobs also remembers that during the interview, Saban told him that someday he wanted to coach in the NFL. They asked Sexton how much it would cost to make Nick Saban their head coach. Sexton told him $900,000. One of the trustees, Weems, said, if we pay him $1.1 million, can we stop talking and get it done? LSU had found their home run hire, and they were going to throw in as much money as they could to keep him. Saban also had more logical demands during the interview. He wanted a new student athlete academic center built with programs to support players. He also wanted updated facilities for the football team. I don't know how Saban kept getting away with this, but there was no buyout if he left LSU. But there was a $2 million buyout if they fired him. That just boggles my mind. 
Some of Saban's first hires at LSU was Jimbo Fisher as his offensive coordinator, who was just previously the offensive coordinator at Cincinnati a year prior, and John Thompson as his defensive coordinator, who was coming from the University of Memphis. He also brought along Dr. Rosen with him periodically, even though he remained as a Michigan State employee too. The LSU team Saban was walking into was chaotic. They had only had winning seasons three of the last 11 years. Their graduation rate was 40%, which was dead last in the SEC. LSU also had a lot of off-the-field issues with their old coach, Nardo, with all sorts of arrests and suspensions. That first year with Saban was very demanding. He had something to prove for how he left Michigan State, and he also had to set the tone for what was expected with his new coaching staff. Remember, these are all new guys. None of his assistants from Michigan State followed him there. He and his staff worked from around 5 a.m. to 11 p.m. every day, leading to the 2000 season, even weekends. It sounded a lot like the work schedule he had while working with the Browns, where he was very demanding and detail-oriented and expected the same from everyone else. Not everyone made it. John Thompson, the defensive coordinator, only lasted 28 days and wound up taking a job with Arkansas. There are rumors that he left due to not fitting in with the culture Saban was cultivating, but he stated that it was because Arkansas was his dream job. Saban ended up hiring Phil Elmassian, who was previously the secondary coach at Wisconsin. They immediately started working on the things Saban wanted for the program. They started making the academic center for the athletes and a new football facility connected to their practice field. At the moment, the team was forced to dress out at the stadium and take a bus to practice every day. Joe Dean, the AD who hired Saban, also decided to retire in 2000, and Skip Bertman replaced him. The next big challenge to take on was recruiting. He had to find a way to keep the local Louisiana talent in state something previous LSU coaches hadn't been able to do. Saban decided to tackle that by visiting every high school coach he could in the year and build a relationship with them. It was also a good way to get his eyes on the local talent. He continued to write personalized letters to players, even before and after big games they had. In the last video, which we got more in depth about Saban's recruiting skills, one thing we talked about was Saban's ability to evaluate talent. Saban didn't like to pay attention to players' recruiting rankings. In the book, Fourth and Goal Every Day, the author Phil Savage talks about the athlete database Saban would implement on his college teams. They would enter in matrix based on the ideal characteristics of a football player for each position. The coaches on his team had to use this data-driven system when recruiting players. They didn't often act on hunches or gut feelings. This kept everyone on the same page. They collected all sorts of data with different letters that represented red flags about players, such as physical attributes or character problems. Some characteristics included their height, weight, speed, their character, competitiveness, and toughness. Each player had different criteria. Their goal usually was to eliminate players rather than find recruits. All these things made a numerical ranking that the team used to determine who to go after. While working for the Browns with Saban, Savage said that the rankings went from 5.0, which they considered a reject, to 8.0, which would be looked at as the best ever at their position. Saban was really good at seeing what ranking a player could eventually become. Who could he turn from a 4 or 5 to a 6? Specifically at LSU, one of his recruits, Jacob Hester, was only a two-star recruit coming out of high school. While playing for LSU, he would become arguably one of their best players. I'm not going to lie, hearing coaches like Saban talk about recruiting can get a little creepy if you take a step back and look at it. Coaches will start talking about how they can tell what players can turn into by looking at the bubble, or their butts. He would also look at things like their bend, specifically at the waist, their hip rotation, and the mobility of their knees and ankles. I truly believe that this is done purely for football evaluation, but it's still pretty weird to think about, since the people getting evaluated are likely 15 to 17 year old boys. And that kind of goes for all football recruiting. At the summer camp Saban holds, each player is measured, down to even their hands and arms. He also liked to implement the five hour golden radius rule, which I kind of showed earlier. Their goal was to recruit all the best players within a five-hour radius of the school. Savage talked in his book about how important it is for family to see their kids play. Look at a school like Michigan. How are they supposed to get players from some of the most talented states in the country, like Florida, Georgia, and Texas, when it's a 10-hour plus drive to get to Ann Arbor? I said this in the last video, but Saban made it a requirement that he had to physically see a player before signing them. He never relied on game film alone. That's why you could sometimes see him at a player's track meet or basketball game. It was a good way to see their physical attributes and mobility in person. Saban was also an expert at convincing these recruits to come play at his school. So far, this has probably been his greatest attribute at every school he's coached at. 
He believed that the first step in winning over any recruit is to win over the parents. He would do a lot of research and would come in wearing nice suits and riding in a car with a personal driver. He wanted the parents to see success and the potential for their kid to get to this level. He could walk in a house and point out specific types of furniture or chinaware to win over the moms and grandmas. Making the parents feel comfortable meant making them know that their child could be taken care of. Saban wasn't so charismatic behind the scenes though with recruiting. Their head recruiting coordinator that season was longtime coach Derek Dooley. They didn't like being with him on recruiting visits, and if anything went wrong, Saban would lose it. He rarely spoke to you otherwise on the visits, always working on something or concentrating on his reports about the recruits on the way there. One way Dooley was able to deal with Saban was by trying to overwork him and give him a taste of his own medicine. One time, he set up back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back meetings for Saban, and Saban got onto them for not giving him a break. Dooley thought deep down that Saban loved it though, and appreciated his staff's hard work. He said another way he messed with him while recruiting was with food. Saban didn't handle his spice as well, and in Louisiana, the food can get quite spicy. Moms like to make a big pot of jambalaya for recruiting visits. Dooley would call moms beforehand and tell them that Saban really loves spices and to load them up. The 2000 season was a classic example of a new coach trying to figure out their team. Their first two games of the year were versus Western Carolina and Houston. Saban thought the team was flat for both of those games. During the pregame warmups against Western Carolina, he made the team do hitting drills to wake them up. They won that game 58 to nothing. But their complacency caught up to them and they ended up losing in a big upset to UAB 13 to 10. Throughout the season, Saban struggled to gel with their defense coordinator, El Macian, and he would only last at LSU for that one season before moving on. Saban supposedly also wasn't a huge fan of their QB that season, Josh Booty. In the making of a coach, it stated that Saban thought Booty wasn't liked enough by his teammates. Jimbo Fisher wanted him to stay as QB1 though, because he thought continuity was important and didn't want to change up the QB too much. LSU went 7-4 that season and earned a bid to play Georgia Tech in the Peach Bowl. At this point, Saban had lost every bowl game he'd coached in, so he took a different approach to this game. He was more laid back in preparing for the game, allowing players to recover and giving players a chance to work on fundamentals like they would in the spring or preseason. They started that Peach Bowl down 14-3. Saban wound up taking over play calling duties on defense and benched Josh Booty for Rohan Davey. LSU's defense didn't give up another point during that game and Davey threw for three touchdowns. They ended up winning the game 28-14, giving Saban his first bowl win. For the 2001 season, Saban racked up a nice recruiting class, including Michael Clayton, Joseph Adai, Marquise Hill, and Andrew Whitworth. He also signed nine of the top 10 recruits in Louisiana. They won their first two games, and then they moved their Auburn game to the end of the year due to the events from 9-11. They then lost to Tennessee and Florida, but overall, the team was getting better and the fan base appreciated Saban's intensity. They then won the next five of their six games, only losing to an Ole Miss team led by Eli Manning. They had done well enough that their end of season matchup against Auburn was now a playing game to make it to the SEC championship. Their defense, which was now led by defense coordinator Gary Gibbs, dominated the game and they won 27-14, setting LSU on a trip to Atlanta to the SEC championship game and getting close to doing what Saban promised the administration he would do. They played against a number two ranked Tennessee team that had already beaten them earlier in the season. Tennessee was heavily favored by the media and fans. Before the game, some people from LSU even noticed boxes of roses near the Tennessee locker room as props for them getting to play in the Rose Bowl for a national championship. Tennessee handled them well in the first half, leaving the game 17-10. At halftime, Saban pulled Davey and put in Matt Mock. Mock and LSU ended up tearing up the Volunteers, and they beat them 31-20. It was their first outright SEC championship win since 1986, and Saban delivered on his first promise to LSU a year early. They went on to play in the Sugar Bowl against Illinois and beat them 47-34. Saban then got a $400,000 raise, bringing his yearly salary to $1.6 million. His new contract included a clause that was comical to me. If he won a national championship, he would need to be paid at least $1 more than the highest paid coach in the country. The book, The Making of a Coach, goes into how Saban spent his coaching career helping many players and coaches that have been written off. For coaches, think people like Butch Jones and Lane Kiffin, who he hired after very public firings. One LSU player that he helped, was Brady James. Within a six month time period, both of James's parents passed away. James was understandably a wreck during this time period. Saban, 
whose father had passed away when he was freshly out of college, was very empathetic to James and was there to listen to him and let him take time to adjust to his new life and helped him work through his problems. Brady James eventually played in the NFL for 10 seasons after LSU. Going into the 2002 season, Gary Gibbs, the defensive coordinator, left to go coach in the NFL. Saban promoted their linebackers coach, Will Muschamp, the defensive coordinator. Around this time, Saban supposedly started his infamous NBA basketball games. Not the NBA we all know, but the NBA as in the Noontime Basketball Association. Saban essentially would force his assistants to play in a pickup basketball game throughout the season during their lunch breaks. These games were known for being heated and have been talked about by many different media outlets. In the making of a coach, Muschamp was quoted about the games saying, he'd walk by my office and tell me we were playing. He didn't ask. Saban chose the teams himself and even handpicked his defender. Hey, he signed my checks, so I'll let him win most of the time, stated Muschamp. I threw some elbows during the games and fist fights broke out pretty frequently. All in all though, those games are really good for the staff. In a recent article from ESPN, Kiffin talked about the games while he was at Bama. He would strategically leave the facility to exercise during these times after being warned about the games. When I got there, they told me all about the games and how coach picks the teams and that if you cover him, you can't foul him and probably should just let him score some. And I'm like, wrong dude, that ain't happening. I'll just go for a jog or something. For the 2002 season, LSU was coming in ranked 14th with Matt Mock, who as we said earlier, came in to win the SEC championship game as a starting QB. Mock and Saban had an interesting relationship from the start. Mock had committed to Michigan State to play for Saban in 1997, but he decided to join the minor leagues to play for the Cubs farm system. Mock got in touch with Saban again once he became the LSU coach and was able to join the team. In the making of a coach, Mock described Saban's practices as military-like. I'd be in practice and throw a pass and complete it. I'd be pretty happy with myself. When all of a sudden, 10 coaches would start yelling and there'd be total chaos. Saban wanted the practices like this as a way to break the players down and bring them back up together. Mock went on to say that it helped come game time. It made them feel calm in stressful situations. In the book Fourth and Goal Every Day by Phil Savage, he perfectly highlights the chaos of Saban's practices. Jake Coker, who is a quarterback at Alabama, talked about how much Saban stressed intensity at practices. He said that he would give it to everyone equally, even spectators in between the fields and in his path just watching the practice. If they were not watching with intensity, he'd be pissed off at him. Savage himself says that when he would attend Bama practices as Bama's color commentator, he would make sure he was always intently doing his job, never looking away from the field and especially never looking at his phone. He said that he was going to do his job the Bama slash Saban way. He truly is a master at getting the entire program on the same page, whether it be their quarterback or even the team's color commenter. Matt Malk would battle with Saban though about his personality. Saban called him into his office one time after kicking Malk out of practice for being what he called disrespectful. Malk walked into his office and straight up told him that he thought he picked favorites on the team and he traded players who did the right thing poorly. He was quoted in The Making of a Coach talking about running back Joseph Adai. He was a fabulous guy and Saban treated him like from other interactions you'll read in The Making of a Coach, I believe Saban loves these fiery types of quarterbacks that stick up for their team and challenge him. There are a lot of similarities when he's at Alabama with quarterback Jake Coker, who had a lot of similarities in how he talked to Saban, and both of these quarterbacks had successful careers with him. The 2002 season was a challenging one. They started the season after just winning the SEC championship game, losing 26-8 to an ACC school, Virginia Tech. Mock missed half the season after getting injured in their sixth game of the season. They then lost to Auburn 31-7. The same week, his wife Terry's mother passed away. The next week, they played Kentucky in a very strange matchup. Kentucky had made a- You can physically see him on the field here. Jimbo called a Hail Mary, and QB Marcus Randall, who had just replaced Mock for the season, threw a pass around 57 yards downfield that was tipped and somehow caught by LSU receiver Devery Henderson, who ran in for a touchdown to win the game. The next week, they lost a heartbreaker to a Matt Jones-led Arkansas team, trying to make it to the SEC championship game. Then, they lost in the Cotton Bowl 35-20 to a Texas team led by wide receiver great Roy Williams. For the 2003 season, they again had some great recruits, including Matt Flynn, Jamarcus Russell, Dwayne Bell, and LaRon Landry. They also had a lot of returning players. That summer before the season, Saban had a scary event where he and Terry were at their lake house in Georgia and he slipped while trying to clean his boat. He ended up slicing his ear and knocking himself unconscious, falling into the lake. His friends saw him and quickly pulled him out 
where he regained consciousness. He ended up needing 25 stitches on his head and ear, but he ended up being okay. LSU started the 2003 season hot. They were quickly 5-0, blowing teams out. There was a scare around this time that Saban might take a job as the Chicago Bears head coach, but that ended up not happening. Then they lost their next game to Florida, 19-7, and a lot of their hype died down. Like I said in my last video though, after this game, Saban didn't panic. He knew that losses like this were part of the process and that there was still a long season to be played. They ended up winning their next six games and finished the regular season 11-1. LSU then crushed Georgia in the SEC championship game, 34-13. The Tigers have been following the Saban process for a few years now and it was finally turning them into a well-oiled machine. One of their O-linemen, Rodney Reed, talked about their goals that season. We had no tangible goals of winning the SEC or the national title that year. The goals were all intangible. We tried to positively affect someone every day, to get better every day, and to stop focusing on the outcome and instead focus on the process. They were set to play Oklahoma in the BCS National Championship game, led by Heisman winning quarterback Jason White. Players said Saban was loose before the game, and it built their confidence heading into the matchup. LSU played very well in the first half, holding the elite Oklahoma offense to only 32 yards, but they only held a 14-7 lead. In the locker room at halftime, Nick Saban cornered Marcus Spears. Spears was quoted saying, he needed me to figure out how I was going to affect the game, that I was a Baton Rouge kid, and that this was the biggest game of my life. In my last video, I told you about how Spears started as a tight end, and Saban converted him to a defensive end. At first, Spears didn't want to transition. Then, Saban showed him how much more money defensive ends made in the NFL at the time, compared to tight ends, and Spears was like, coach, let me try this defensive thing out and see what happens. Spears was very close to Saban while at LSU, and he came out in the second half hot. On the first play from scrimmage, he sacked White for a loss of 7 yards. On Oklahoma's next offensive play, he intercepted a pass and ran back 20 yards for a touchdown. LSU held on the rest of the game and with 151 left in the game and with a 21-14 lead, LSU QB Matt Mock and the offense failed to run out the clock and left 9 seconds for Oklahoma to score. They would eventually run out the clock on the punt and won the game. You would think after all this, at the age of 52, Saban would enjoy this moment. He achieved the goal he promised the LSU administration a year earlier than he said he would. But no, he gave Jimbo Fisher and his staff a hard time because they didn't close out the game well. As I've mentioned before, an LSU trustee talked to Saban after the game and found him alone in the locker room saying, what am I going to do now? How am I going to follow this up? He apparently even called Dr. Rosen after the game and asked him, why don't I feel happy? He even grabbed random players like Matt Mock and Michael Clayton immediately after the game and asked him straight up, I need to know what you guys are doing next year. There were some rumors about Saban potentially going to the NFL after that season, and he was very close to signing with the Chicago Bears, but ended up staying at LSU and signing a seven-year, $18.45 million deal, which included $400,000 in bonuses for making bowl games. It was the largest deal ever for a college football coach. To start the 2004 season, Saban hired a young FSU grad assistant, Kirby Smart, onto his staff. That year, they recruited well again, getting players like Jacob Hester, Early Doucette, and Glenn Dorsey. They started off the season pretty slow and had two losses midway through the season. They had trouble deciding on their QB, rotating between Marcus Randall and Jamarcus Russell. By this time in the season, rumors started to appear about the Miami Dolphins starting to show interest in Nick Saban as their next head coach. Around this time, Saban's agent, Jimmy Sexton, was spotted at a Dolphins game for no reason. Saban initially seemed disinterested in the job, telling the media that he was happy where he was. LSU finished that season 9-2 and, and was set to play Iowa in the Capital One Bowl. Miami's billionaire owner, Wayne Huizenga, was determined to do his best to recruit Saban and came after him hard following the regular season. He flew into Baton Rouge on his private jet during LSU's first bowl practice with his Dolphins logo proudly displayed on the plane. He spent that night eating dinner with Saban at their house. With there not being a buyout clause, Saban had a lot of power here and openly let Miami recruit him. The Dolphins were desperate and had recently had some difficult times. They had hired Dan Marino to run the front office and he quit three weeks in. Ricky Williams, their running back, was busted for pot and had decided to retire from football altogether. One of the team's best receivers, David Boston, had been caught using steroids and got injured and missed the previous season. Huizinga liked that Saban was very disciplined and that he already had NFL experience coaching with Belichick at the Browns. Huizinga did the two best things he could to convince Saban to go to the NFL. He threw a lot of money at him and he gave him near total control of the program. Saban ended up telling everyone while in Orlando for the bowl game 
that he was taking the Miami Dolphins job. He would end up signing a five-year deal worth $22.5 million and would have complete control over personnel, scouting, drafting, and the hiring of assistants. But just like every coaching change Saban has ever had, the biggest factor to come into play was his wife, Terry. In the making of a coach, Burke says that supposedly when Uzinga left the Saban house, he handed Terry a check with at least five zeros on it and said, just in case y'all decide to come, here's something for you to decorate the house with. Saban coached that last game with LSU and lost to Iowa 30 to 25 on a 56 yard touchdown pass. On the final play of the game, the LSU administration didn't have a ton of ill will towards Saban when he left. Let's be honest, he left them with two SEC championships and a national championship, delivering on his promise he made during his interview. He also told him during that same interview that he wanted to coach in the NFL. Their academics had improved tremendously as well compared to when players were getting suspended for not making grades like before Saban arrived. He turned LSU into a powerhouse and he even won another national title three years later with a lot of players that Saban himself recruited. Saban had been working on a book during this time that we've quoted in this series called How Good Do You Want to Be? It was published three days after he took the Dolphins job, and the cover is a picture of Nick Saban in his LSU gear. Current copies now have a picture of him at Alabama. I just thought this was something funny that happened during this time. It's a good book and you should read it if you're interested in Saban at all. Now, we get into my favorite part of the Nick Saban saga. He had his cute moment in college football with his process where he could boss around college athletes. Let's see what he does now with athletes who make over twice what he makes in a year. The NFL had changed a lot in the 10 years since Saban had coached in it. Players had a lot more power and they took advantage of it. College always relies on the strength of the coach, whereas the NFL is usually reliant on the combination of the players, coaching staff, and the behind the scenes management. There are a lot of weird and uncomfortable stories that came out of Saban's time with Miami. During his first training camp, during their rookie talent show, Matt Roth and Channing Crowder had Saban sit in a chair on stage and attempted to have a stripper dance for him. KJ Harris was in charge of the music, but couldn't get it to work. As soon as the stripper got in front of Saban, he stood up quickly and walked off stage and hustled up the stairs in silence. It was a long, awkward walk as he left the room, and as soon as the door closed, the room erupted in laughter. There's another story from the start of the season during OTAs where their nose guard, Keith Trailer, a 14-year vet, had a clause in his contract where he didn't have to condition. Saban stared at him angrily during sprints one time because Trailer was jogging. Once he realized Saban was staring at him, he taunted Saban saying, Hey Nick, hey Nick. Saban supposedly hated being called Nick and wanted to be called coach. He told Trailer to shut the hell up and Trailer said, Who the f*** do you think you're talking to? while watching the practice and started a big uproar at the practice. A similar thing happened in the offseason while nine-year vet Zach Thomas was getting into a shouting match on the field with an assistant. Saban stopped practice, ran over to Thomas, and told him to shut the f*** up. Thomas yelled right back at Saban and said, shut the f*** up, and then yelled, I'm a grown ass man. Other players had to pull Thomas away from the situation. There were good parts of the job. Saban and Terry purchased a $6.7 million house. He vacationed with Uzinga, sailing on his yacht with him, even getting to visit Costa Rica, where his family is originally from. He was able to get Miami to build a $10 million practice bubble. He was also able to hire any assistants he wanted. The Dolphins went 4-12 the season before Saban arrived. It wasn't a great situation he was coming into. They hadn't performed well in recent drafts. They didn't have enough money to target big players in free agency. And their outlook going into the 2005 draft didn't look great either. Their biggest problem was that they didn't really have a great option at QB. Coming in, only Gus Verrott and AJ Feely were on the roster, neither being all that great at the time. Their defense was also old. Eight of their 11 starters were 30 or older. Saban also was trying to change their defense from a 4-3 to a 3-4, which would require changing up who he had in the game. He hired Scott Leinhon as his offensive coordinator, who had previously been the coordinator for the Vikings. He had three different coaches turn down the defense coordinator spot. Eventually, Richard Smith took it, who was previously a linebackers coach for the Lions. All the chaos and pressure for Saban made him even more tightly wound than he typically was. He would sometimes have big blow-ups with his staff. One thing about Nick Saban that I haven't said yet is that he loves Little Debbie oatmeal cream pies. He's been on record saying that he eats them every morning with his coffee. One time while at Miami, he supposedly exploded at a young staffer because they bought boxes of Little Debbies instead of the individually wrapped ones he preferred. An equipment manager, after saying good morning to Saban one day, was instructed by another staffer never to speak to him unless first spoken to because Saban wanted to concentrate on football. He would get on the players for what they wore on the sidelines. Channing Crowder re recalls asking Saban how Terry was doing one time 
and he responded to him with, she'll be a lot better if you can cover backs on third down, all while having a very stoic expression on his face. To be fair, from what I've learned about Terry so far, she probably would feel a lot happier, the better Crowder was on defense. Manuel Wright was one of their riskier draft picks in 2005, due to being overweight and having some off the field issues. Saban tried to take him under his wing early on because he had a lot of potential. He stayed undisciplined though, throughout training camp, gaining even more weight. Saban lost it one day when Wright walked out to practice without a helmet or pads on, and in the wrong shoes. Saban yelled at him quickly, but there was a TV crew there that filmed it, showing him screaming, and it even showed Wright wiping a tear from his eye. There was a scary incident that season with offensive lineman Geno James. During one of their practices, he felt terrible, but decided to practice anyways. It was a two-a-day, and at the end of the second practice, he headed back to the locker room. I don't remember much after that, Gino said in the book, The Making of a Coach. Apparently, he collapsed on the ground, eyes on the back of his head, convulsing and vomiting, according to players. Then Saban walked in. Crowder said that Saban looked briefly down at Gino, stutter-stepped, and then walked right over him and kept going, and didn't look back. When the medical staff showed up, they were panicking, thinking he was dying right there on the floor. James said that all he remembers was when they put paddles on him to bring him back. He was flown to Broward Hospital, and when he woke up, Saban was there. Obviously at this point, Gino didn't know what Saban had done. Saban tried to explain himself, but the team didn't think it was sincere. He had basically lost their trust as soon as he became coach. Once James found out, he said he didn't know how to feel, and that they didn't have much of a relationship after that. The Dolphins won their first game that season versus the Broncos, but they quickly lost four of their next five games, making them 2-4. and four. Because of Hurricane Katrina, they played the Saints at LSU Stadium and beat them 21-6. He then lost to his good friend Bill Belichick with QB Tom Brady. They were 3-6, and six, and most of their losses were close. That is, until they got blown out 22-0 to, to the Browns, making them 3-7. and seven. After that game, Saban reflected and told the media that he was focused on building a team for the future and not the results. I feel like if you're an opponent and you hear Saban say that he's not focused on the results, you should start running because process thinking is about to take over and there's no telling what will happen next. All of a sudden, Saban started winning. They beat Oakland the next week and then came back against the Bills after being down 23-3 in the fourth quarter and beat them 24-23. They then didn't lose another game for the rest of the regular season and finished with a 9-7 record. A big part of their success that season came from their superstar running back, Ricky Williams. A year before Saban arrived in Miami, Williams had tested positive for marijuana and retired from football. He then spent time wandering the globe. He lived in a tent in Australia, spent time at a yoga center in India, studied holistic medicine, became vegetarian, and even lost 25 pounds. Saban tried his best and eventually got him back on the team, and he was an absolute beast on the field. He was definitely their star on offense, but the team was still missing something, a competent QB. Saban knew he needed one if he was going to last in the NFL. Him bringing Williams back sparked some controversy with the fan base due to his off the field issues, but it actually helped him gain back a lot of that respect he lost from the team. In early 2006 though, Williams failed another drug test, giving him a year long suspension, leaving Miami without their most talented player and without a quarterback. Saban still stuck by him during this time and even let him play that season in the Canadian Football League. Going into that 2006 season, they were in search of a franchise quarterback. Saban determined early on that they didn't want to go after one in the draft so they stuck with free agency. The top QBs in that draft were Vince Young and Matt Leinart. Both QBs they wanted though were coming off significant injuries. Drew Brees had one of the nastiest shoulder injuries I've ever seen on his throwing shoulder. Dante Culpepper, who had just been dominant with the Minnesota Vikings, had torn ligaments in his knee. He was not a free agent, but wanted a trade. Saban made it seem like he was more interested in Brees at the time. But from a medical standpoint, Culpepper seemed like a less risky move and that's who they ended up going with. The Dolphins went into that season with a lot of hype after finishing the previous season well and signing a QB. The problem was, the QB they got might not have actually been the same QB that they saw before the injury. They started that season 1-3 and, and Culpepper had been sacked 21 times already and just wasn't playing well. At this point, Saban really started to gain his players respect back. Some of the other incidents he had earlier were more taken with a grain of salt now and all those players involved in those incidents were still on the team and performing well. Even Crowder, who we mentioned earlier had a weird interaction with him, is quoted in the making of a coach, saying that he and the younger players on the team loved him. He maximized my ability and taught me the game. He was a master on the defensive side of the ball. Jason Taylor was even named the Defensive Player of the Year that season, helped by his progress with Saban. Something changed though, going into their game against the Patriots. 
The Culpepper signing was a big deal at the time. He immediately had the respect of the team because of his successful career at that point, and his Dolphins jersey was one of the top sellers that season in the NFL. On that Friday's practice, Saban called the first team offense. When Culpepper ran into the huddle, he found second string QB Joey Harrington standing in the huddle. Realizing that he had just been benched without any warning, he lost it and headed straight for Saban. When Saban started walking towards him, Culpepper yelled, You better get your short motherfucking ass away from me, you lying motherfucker. Why didn't you tell me like a man? Culpepper wouldn't play another snap for the Dolphins, and Harrington struggled that year. It's hard to win the NFL when your leader on the team doesn't play. Culpepper checked out for the rest of that season, and Saban had lost the locker room for good. He was starting to have some serious concerns about this whole coaching in the NFL thing. In November of 2006, Alabama lost to Mississippi State. This was huge because they never lost to Mississippi State. The Dolphins had just upset a previously undefeated Bears team to be 2-6. The idea started floating around that maybe Saban could come coach at Bama. This is funny though because Bama was currently coached by Mike Shula, son of the iconic past Dolphins coach, Don Shula. The Dolphins then had a four-game winning streak, which made their record 5-6. A few days earlier, Alabama lost to Auburn in the Iron Bowl, and they fired Mike Shula. Rumors really started circulating at this point, and the entire time, Saban and his agent Sexton kept saying that there was no way they were leaving the NFL. On December 21st, he gave the best quote ever. I guess I just have to say it. I'm not going to be the Alabama coach. To say it, I'm not going to be the Alabama coach. What, what, I shouldn't even have to comment on this. I think I've said this over and over and over again. I mean, honestly, what is he supposed to do in this situation? At this point, he may have honestly believed he wasn't going to be the next Alabama head coach. Also, he still had a team to coach, and is doing his best to keep everyone focused on that season. The Dolphins ended up beating the Patriots that year, and then lost every game after that, and they finished the season 6-10. I think Saban truly agonized over these types of decisions. I think he thought he had a job he was hired to do at Miami, and he believed that he hadn't finished that job yet. It seems like he had been chasing happiness his entire career, and still hadn't found it. As bad as he wanted to finish what he started, I think he knew that his personality wasn't meant for the NFL. He could never truly be in complete control, coaching players who were making millions of dollars. Also, it wasn't entirely his decision alone on whether or not to stay in the NFL or go back to college. He also had his family to think about. Now Moore, the Alabama athletic director, showed up to Saban's house around this time one day to try and recruit Saban. Apparently, he got to speak with Nick's wife Terry while Nick was still at work and she told him about how Nick wanted out of the NFL, and she also wanted him out. We've talked about this already, but being the coach's wife in the NFL doesn't mean much. Being the coach's wife for a big college team is like being the first lady for the president, but for that particular college town. She also probably thought that a quiet place like Tuscaloosa was a better place to raise her kids compared to a huge city like Miami. Terry invited him back over for dinner that night. Moore offered Saban whatever they could, Alabama is a school that prides themselves on football, and they had been pretty bad for a while. They were desperate to get back on top, and were trying to do whatever it took to get there. They offered him complete control of the program, and a lot of money. An eight-year contract worth $32 million. Those are the two main things you need to tell Saban, I believe, to really get him going. Offer him a lot of money, and tell him he'll have complete control over his team. On January 3rd, Saban told Uzinga he was leaving. Uzinga saw how much the decision pained Saban, and he was ultimately okay with it, understanding that it truly wasn't personal. The media frenzy after this was insane though. There was a mob of reporters outside of his house. He wasn't able to tell his staff what he was doing, and most of his players were all over the place, due to it being the off season for them. A helicopter even followed their car to the airport as they were leaving. In the making of a coach, on the plane ride with Saban at Tuscaloosa, Mal Moore sat across from Saban and looked up at his new coach. Saban asked him, Mal, let me ask you something. Do you think you fired the best coach in the country? Moore was taken aback at first and said, Why, Nick, of course I do. Saban responded saying, Well, you didn't. I'm nothing without my players. But you did just hire a hell of a recruiter. Thank you for watching the College Football History Channel. That's going to be it for part three of this episode on Nick Saban. Like I said earlier, I do plan on eventually making a part four episode where I go over his time at Alabama, but I might make a few videos first before I get to that. If you like what you see, make sure you subscribe to the channel as I'll be posting more videos like this in the future. Feel free to reach out and share your thoughts or if you have any suggestions for future episodes.